my name is Adi Melenciano, and I was invited to give a talk on Omni Specialized Design for Beautiful Features, which is a combination of my design practice and synthesizing a variety of different forms of design and art and engagement, social practice, um, and thinking about how we can design in a way that's very uh, equitable, long lasting, sustainable, um, and healthy. So to give context as to who I am, at the core I'm an artist, I love to create with whatever is around me. Um, and my art practice has extended to technology and design and that technology for me has always been a tool that really expands the possibility of art and it allows for more people to engage with the art that the artist has created and really kind of destroys the dichotomy between the artist and the viewer. And then has also extended into a design and that I, I don't want to just create just to create, but I want to create to solve and create to enhance and uplift. Um, and so those practices have then infiltrated into my research practice, which is very much studying the way that I've developed and created and studying how other people have developed and created and how all of these things then impact people. And I have decided that I'd like to move beyond just studying how design impacts um, humans in various forms, but how design impacts the ecology, the world, the planet, um, and all sentient beings. Um, my practice has also extended beyond practicing, but um, teaching. So I teach at um, New York University on technology and society, and I teach at the Pratt Institute on design. And my favorite part of being an educator is continuing to be a student and learning from my, from my students. Um, so I'm a lifelong student. I just love to continue learning. The case studies within this presentation, um, I felt like it would be good to kind of ground the theory and practice that I would be sharing in this sort of idea of omni specialized design by showing examples of the ways that I've practiced this in my own life and in my own work. And three of them that I've chosen are Aftertopia, which is a social institution that I created while a graduate student a few years ago at New York University. The Revolution Will Be Digitized, which is a New York University course that I developed and taught last semester in 2019 and building in 2019 or 2020, this past semester in 2020 and building a museum 353 years in the future, which I was invited to do a residency um, and decided that I wanted to create a space for us to think about the future, so speculative design. So Afrotectopia is a social institution fostering interdisciplinary innovation at the intersections of art, design, technology, black culture, and racial activism. Um, I created it uh, while a graduate student in a technology program and being so excited by all the ways that we can use technology um, but also realizing the ways that technology is very powerful and can be very harmful to people, especially black communities and marginalized communities, and how um, easily and seamlessly it just infiltrates our lives and controls what we have access to and what we see and um, the, the way that we're able to live. Um, so learned of, learning about all these things, I wanted to be in a community that was also thinking about these things because I couldn't find spaces where we're talking about technology and race and culture in tandem. It was always siloed and those um, branches never really bridged together um, and didn't have any mentors or people to look to that were creating work that were inspiring me, that were thinking about blackness and race and technology at the same time um, and just wanted to create a space of celebration for black culture in the middle of a tech space. Um, so it culminated or materialized into an annual festival. So we collaboratively designed Black Futures, we share research, and we highlight and celebrate innovative work. It's also turned into a school of Afrotectopia, which is an alternative adult school, merging art, design, technology, Black culture, and activism, and exploration and realizing imaginative opportunities. And it's become a summer camp, so teaching STEAM to Black youth that acknowledges and centers the innovation of the Pan-African diaspora and cultivates innovation that promotes cultural expression and racial activism. And the course that I taught uh, and developed at NYU is called The Revolution Will Be Digitized. So this is a course that thinks about um, people like Joe Scott Haran and Norbert Wiener. Um, Joe Scott Haran's The Revolution Will Not Be Televised, which um, the title obviously came from, and Norbert Wiener and cybernetics and that being basically the seed of artificial intelligence and social uprisings like the one that happened in Egypt, entire square um, communities like the Black Panther Party um, uh, and ideologies and practices like post-work societies and beyond. And so the course was designed to explore societal impacts of technology by examining how race, socioeconomics, and power have historically operated in America, studying ways those tactics are being embedded into technology today and potentially the future, 
engaging in a variety of speculative design practices because um, if we are studying the past and we want to create a better future, we need to be very speculative and imaginative. And culminating in designing an equitable technoculture manifesto for the future. So we study the past, we observe our reality, current reality, we get very far ahead in imaginative and speculative design, and then we come back and, and create a roadmap on how to get to this future world that um, is more healthy and sustainable. And building a museum 353 years in the future, I was invited um, to do a residency at, I uh, forgot where, but um, basically what I wanted to create was an environment um, where, because I was thinking about our times and how me as an artist growing up and then becoming a technologist, how a lot of my technology work, um, it became very focused on the political times that we were in and consumed by race and critical race theory and activism. When um, traditionally being an artist all my life, my art was never um, a tool for activism. I guess, I don't know, but it, it, I didn't feel like um, the pressure of all these different identities that people assume that I have by looking at me. Um, I didn't feel that pressure, but I, I definitely felt that as I got older and I became a lot more aware of the way that the world was working um, and became very frustrated and I wanted to use everything that I had to dismantle these systems. So um, it overcame my uh, artistic practice and it became very exhausting. And so I wanted to create a space where Black people that I knew um, that traditionally operate within these spaces that are uh, activist oriented where we could get a, we could um, embrace the moment where we're not thinking about using artistic practices for activist purposes. Instead, we're allowed to be human beings on a planet who are able to just create um, beyond their identity, their social identity. Um, and what would we create if we were able to do things beyond our social identity and beyond needing to uplift our community? What if we could just be um, human beings in the ways that a lot of other communities are able to just live. So I wanted to create that sort of environment. And I also wanted to put that environment so far ahead in the future. Um, and it's beyond all this racism and oppression. And we're looking back at where we physically are. We're looking back mentally at where we physically are and thinking about, okay, well, we're in this future. What are the steps that we need to take to let all the people that are physically where we are come to where we are mentally? So it's an exploration of the eradication of racial oppression in future times through speculative design and futuristic ideating of a utopian society and city. And so we're creating a vision. How do we want to live existing in that vision? What do we what would it be like to live in that state and working backwards from that vision? How do we get to our desired state? Um, and so what do I mean when I say omni-specialized design for beautiful futures? Omni-specialized is a term that I've gotten from Buckminster Fuller, who's a designer, and he's very much into not siloing different branches of design, which is the way that I've always naturally operated. Um, and it was great to learn about a term that really, uh, you know, gave a name to that kind of thinking. And we're using this co comprehensive, cohesive design practice to then realize futures that are beautiful, harmonious, and healthy. So Benjamin Bratton, a theorist and philosopher, said the job of design in the 21st century is to undo much of the design of the 20th century. And I think that's such an important thing for us to realize is that the things that we were taught, the status quo, all of these things have been very harmful. Um, and the things that we've been taught being in a Western society um, are, can be very harmful to the planet, to people, to beings. Um, and we really need to think about going against the status quo, or at the very least questioning the status quo, why it is implemented, why do we do that? Um, really questioning, because so oftentimes we just consume and accept. So questioning and um, analyzing if it is what we need, and if it's not, reimagining it and implementing something that serves us better. So rethinking design, what is the role of a designer? Um, what principles are we building design off of and ways to consider? These are all three main things that I want us to consider in creating beautiful futures through design. So the role of a designer, we assume that it's a visionary leader, sort of independent kind of person, but it's not, it's not someone that's just creating on their own. Um, and I'm guilty of this, I often do create a lot on my own, but it's not really that I'm, I may be physically alone, but I am studying so many different people and cultures and movements and societies and learning and, and grabbing their techniques and kind of synthesizing them together to create things like this presentation alone. So it's not about you being in your own head or it's not about someone that's the quote unquote genius and they're a visionary. It's more of, it, it needs to be um, someone that is a, or I'll go to Victor Papenick's quote of design has to be done by a team. This team must not only 
consists not only of someone who is a designer, it must consist of people from other disciplines. And the most important team member besides the designer is a member of the Victor Says user group. Um, but a lot of people in design practices that are pretty socially engaged and aware are often uncomfortable with the idea of user. User has a, a strong connotation that's not the most positive and empowering. Um, and so for me, I rather would rather use something like intended beneficiary. Um, but so, but generally what Victor is saying is that we need to be as designers, people that are um, not alone, we are working interdisciplinary. So people have a lot of different specialties and expertise. And generally when we are designing, we cannot do it absent of the people that we are intending to serve. We need to include them. They have very valuable expertise that we need to value and incorporate in our design practice. So a designer, they are working with historians, artists, engineers, scientists, but most especially the community member, because we need to be designing with, not for, we should never be going into spaces and thinking that we have all this knowledge and we know how things work and designing for them. And I think that's something that's generally done with this sort of white savior complex, but it's not just white people. It's also black people, black people, colonized people can also go into spaces like Africa and say, you know, I want to bring all my intelligence to your space, but really Africa and not that Africa is like this one being, it's not a country, it's a whole continent that's incredibly diverse, but um, we need to respect the local traditions and indigenous innovation uh, and ancestral intelligence. We need to respect all of that and understand that they have a lot to offer that we could learn from too. So we should be designing with, not for. And so um, in this presentation, I'll be tying in my case studies into these different theories and practices that I'm also going to talk about. So for the first one, um, Afrodictopia. Afrodictopia is very much a bias for us movement. It's not something that was designed for Black people. It's something that was designed with and by Black people. I was a student. I was an artist, a technologist. Um, and I was working with other Black students and artists and technologists. And I was working with Black teachers and Black uh, designers and creators and all of us were working um, to create this and to empower this and to uplift this and people were advising. We were all creating something um, that was serving us. And the objective of Afrotopia is to design and realize healthy and sustainable Black futures with or without technology, though it is the tool of choice. So when we're creating futures and we're engaging in speculative design, it's most important that we're doing things interdisciplinary. We are considering a lot of different expertise because when we don't, we'll have blind spots and we're not going to create something that's sustainable. So knowing for me that I wanted to create a space where we were imagining the future, I knew it was important that this is a space that's welcoming of all kinds of people. And so the first from the very beginning um, people of many different careers and professions felt comfortable being in this space we had lawyers and politicians um, and engineers and scientists and everyone coming together and learning um, and these people that I've drawn arrows to these different people these are not specifically these people that are um, of different demographics but generally Afrotopia has been a space of a variety of demographics professionally where we're all coming together and learning from each other so what principles are we building design off of? Uh, well, since European enlightenment, it's been industrialization and capitalism. We're often thinking about how can design be used to create as much profit as possible as in as short of time as possible. And that's extremely, it, it is profitable. It has been successful in getting a lot of people very wealthy, but it makes very few people wealthy and it destroys everyone else's lives and their, the way they're living and the land that they're living off of, it's extremely extractive and exploitative. So it, it's really a myth, uh, mythology of technology, as Julia Watson says, and that it's bringing together, and it's rooted out of bringing together humanism, colonialism, racism, which inherently produce capitalism, and it's negating local wisdom and social intelligence and indigenous innovation. So it's not thinking about the ways that we can actually create sustainable design, and it's very much about let's just um, make money quickly which can be extremely, and which has proven to be extremely harmful, harmful in a variety of ways. And it's ignoring the fact that technology is really the most perfect nature. We're often so quick to assume that we need to do anything to make AI and all these technologies as um, powerful as possible, but we can learn so much from the way that the world around us is structured and the way that it operates and be guided by that. And we can do that in thinking about economies or the economy in general. So generally we practice in a sort of linear economy where we're profiting off of obsolete or waste. So we produce, we use raw material, then we produce with it, then we use it, and then the product of that turns into non-recyclable waste. 
Um, and examples of that are companies that I love, even Apple, but still they're really good at creating obsolescence and that which then becomes um, waste and is incredibly harmful. So changing the charger design every few years and making or encouraging you to buy a brand new phone when you really don't need to for the next year, you could really keep the same phone for five years. Um, it's it's, it's very harmful and wasteful. And instead, we could think about circular design, um, where, where nothing goes to waste. And so this is, um, we could think about the ecology, which is a branch of biology that deals with the relations of organisms to one another and their physical surroundings. And we can especially think about biomimicry, where it's the design and production of material structures and systems that are modeled on biological entities and processes. So basically, how can we create systems? How can we create anything that we're mimicking the design of biology and natural systems? systems. So with a circular economy, um, we would use raw material. We would produce with that raw material. We would then use that raw material. It turns into a product and then we recycle whatever is left and you just keep doing that. So nothing goes to waste. And we can think about very basic things that we've learned in um, elementary school, like the water cycle. Water never goes to waste. We're constantly using it and recycling it. Water should never go to waste in the natural system. Um, and just like food, food, we, it grows out the ground, we eat it, we consume it, we throw away what we don't eat and everything else that we do eat, it still goes into the soil and it, um, it creates healthier soil through compost and then produces more food. So these are all things that are, everything is helping the next step. And we're getting closer to circular design or thinking about that, even in the mass industrialized age, like a company called Bionic, where they are turning such a harmful waste like plastic into things like apparel and footwear and automotive um, fabrics like uh, uh, seat coverings. But even still, once we have the apparel and the footwear and the uh, coverings, they become waste um, themselves. So we're getting closer to using and recycling wasteful products into things that we can use, but we really need to continue thinking about how we can create this full cycle where nothing goes to waste. And we really, I feel like human-centered design has been something that I, I grew up admiring and thought it was a great thing, but it, I watched it be universally applied to everything. And I think it's pretty silly and it really requires us as humans to take a step back and realize that this, this earth was not designed to serve us. It's not for us. We are one being on this entire planet in company of so many others and we really need to work together and not have, not consider, not be so self-centered basically. Um, and think about why are we creating these boundaries between the human and non-human and the flora and fauna and the supernatural. Are there other values or principles that we can take into account that will bring us closer as opposed to creating divisions? Because for a really, really long time, we have been designing with the exclusion of all other life forms, says Dory Turnstall, the Dean of OCAD, um, Ontario College of Art and Design. So really what I'm pushing for is us getting away from human-centered design and thinking a lot more about ecologically-centered design. How can we create things that are beneficial to all, all sentient beings on the planet? So we're moving from anti-siloed, anti-dichotomized, and pro-whole systemized design. We are not branching different understandings of the world and putting people in these little areas and saying that you can't talk to each other. It's about bringing us all together, about destroying these walls of dichotomy and creating and fostering this whole, whole systemized design. We're looking at the whole picture. And when we do that, especially with pedagogy and research, it gives us a fuller picture. And oftentimes when we are siloed and we have sciences and we think that this is an objective thing, which it's not, science is political, and just as humanities, even when we put it by itself and we think of humanities is an is a objective or sort of objective thing, but it's not. It always depends on who's giving their understanding based on observing. Um, and this is ties back to second wave cybernetics. So I mentioned cybernetics earlier on of cybernetics basically being the seed of artificial intelligence. Well, eventually anthropologists got a hold of cybernetics and they realized that, you no, know, you can't just say that cybernetics, which is basically a loop, a feedback loop, something happens and then there's a response and you understand that. You have to take a step back as someone that is observing that feedback loop and you have to then take a step back again outside of your experience and realize that you are a being with your own biases and your own understandings of the world. And you, the way you observe a process to happen is a reflection of who you are. So everyone has their own perspective of the way that something's happening. And oftentimes when we give names to processes or ideas, um, we can dismiss a reality. And the way that we don't dismiss realities is we require multiple perspectives. So I think often about the times that I study a lot of Eastern spirituality and Eastern religion and practices 
and I'm a Western person, I'm a Western person of African descent, and I'm learning about this from Western people of European descent that are teaching me about Eastern spirituality. So I, I'm I already know I'm, I'm reading Tao Te Ching, and I'm reading three different translations of it by white men, and know that a lot is missing from Eastern intelligence. And what do they actually mean? Because in reading these different translations, I'm seeing different interpretations of the Eastern philosophy. So all that to say that we really need to focus on multiple perspectives and not take just one person's perspective on what's happening as law. And so that's what was happening in the course that I developed at a new university called The Revolution Will Be Digitized. So we were not just thinking about technology. And obviously the title would allow us to think that we're also thinking about politics. We weren't just thinking about technology and politics, but we were also thinking about ecology, public policy, sociology, media, military, design, surveillance, and economics, how all of these things worked together because they have, everything is working together to create um, the realities that we're living in today where technology can be incredibly harmful to people of different communities, most especially marginalized and most, most especially Black and Latin communities. So ways to design. Um, a key ethos to respectful design is an understanding of how things can have many different meanings for different people. How we recognize the intrinsic worth of everything and everyone, not because they may be useful to us, but because they exist in the universe. They have a meaning and a purpose that is their own. Again, I'm quoting Dory from um, Turnstile, Dean Dory from um, Ontario College of Art and Design and her university's idea of respectful design of we need to as westernized as we are um we're, we've been taught to be very global in thinking but the way that we're practicing globalization is a, a, a big way of homogenization we're trying to create these universal ways of talking with one another and operating in processes but it's negating the local intelligence of of other cultures and so when we're doing that we are not being respectful in our design and we really need to practice understanding that people are going to exist and processes are, are going to exist and they're going to have their own purpose and their own meaning and it doesn't need to serve us we don't need to make everything serve us and so when we think about ways to design i also want us to think about biomimocratic and sustainable design. Um, and one of my favorite examples is from um, learning about these areas in India which have heavy monsoons and they would build these bridges to get from one town to another town or one community to another community. Um, but the bridges would be destroyed because of how powerful the monsoons are. So they instead created entire bridges out of the roots of fig trees. And so they would guide these fig trees roots to grow in certain directions across rivers and create these bridges and it could take 30 years at least sometimes. And so they're thinking generations ahead of themselves and thinking generations ahead of yourselves is the whole reason that sustainability exists. It was rooted in um, Native American uh, ideologies of practicing seven generations ahead of you. That's where sustainable comes from. And so really it's about creating design that is not about something that we can profit off of right now, right in the moment, not always that, not exclusively that, but it's also thinking about how we can create design that is thinking about the generations that are going to follow after us and make sure that they can live in a healthy way. And my last way of design that I wanna say is uh, working backwards, which is what I was doing when I created the workshop for building a museum 350 years in the future of, we need to have visions. Where, what are we fighting for? What do we wanna get? Um, in this world. And when we imagine and design that, then we're able to work backwards and say, okay, now I know that I want to be able to live in a world where, you know, healthcare is free for all. And maybe healthcare has no um, scientific, no like pills or anything, but we're just eating foods naturally and we're taking care of ourselves with the things that are growing out of the earth. Um, and so when we create these visions, we're thinking, but how do we get there? And when we have a vision and we design that full vision, we then have a full picture. And so then we can work backwards and pick that full picture apart into actionable steps on how do we get there from where we are now. And generally, I'd like us to move from being reactionary to visionary. I don't say that we only need to be visionary, but I think that a lot of more, a lot more of us should be more visionary um, because I think that it's so easy to be reactionary and of this moment and to allow the things that are happening right in this moment to um, affect the way that we are processing and living. And I think if we think a lot further ahead, 
um, will have much more sustainable and long lasting change. And I'd say this in the middle of an uprising where a lot of us are, we're doing incredible work. Um, the people that are reactionary are doing incredible work protesting and we need that. We need reactionary work, but we also need people while we are protesting to also design visions. What are we protesting for? What do we hope to get out of all this? And we, we have to move from yearning for instant gratification, which is something that Instagram teaches us so well on Twitter. We put something up and we instantly want to see people appreciate it and accept it. But thinking more about sustainability, I, I know art practices have changed a lot of the way that we're practicing on Instagram is we want to become popular fast as quickly as possible. And but we're not really focusing on developing ourselves as strongly as possible as as expert and as great of artists as we can be. And it's about really investing time in yourself and exposing yourself to a lot and giving yourself time to reflect so that you can be sustainable so that you're not burning out. And that's just one example of the ways that we should move from instant to sustainable. Um, but generally, I think that should be designed, that should be implemented in design practices of not looking so much about how we can make a quick buck now, but how we can make a, a fruitful future 30, 50 years from now. And I generally want us to always question status quo. We often take them as they are and we think that they're law, but they're not. The way that people, the way that we're living now, it's all been designed by people. And so if we think about how someone like us designed law, someone like us designed architecture, we can really challenge that and say, maybe it should be practiced differently. I wanna encourage plurality versus homogenization, which is something tied to earlier what I was talking about globalization of. It's not about making this universal anything. It's about embracing plurality and accepting that things and people operate differently. Globalization is great when, and when the dominating force is able to universalize the way everyone else works so that they can make money off of it. But plurality is where really where a lot of um, interesting things come into fruition. To the center the dominating and center the most vulnerable. And I say that specifically about social uprisings and social activism and generally activism and the way that we've designed our social order of we need to center the people that have been marginalized the most. When those people feel like they're living a healthy life, everyone else is going to live a healthy life. That's just the way that it works. If people that are um, are physically disabled in some way. If we design worlds that make it so that physically disabled people can live healthily, healthfully and fruitfully and happily in a world everyone else can also live fruitfully and happily uh, and playing the long game. So again, not being so quick about instant gratification, but thinking about how we can be sustainable and long lasting. So bibliography, some books that I've read, I didn't write, like I've read so many, but these were the most recent that really tie specifically to the things that I've learned, which is Pat, Politics of Design by Victor Papanek, Low Tech Design, which is where I got the um, bridges from, and just generally the ways that we can think about the ecology in a, in a way where we um, reflect it through other forms of design and pattern thinking by Buckminster Fuller. So thank you.